All righty, folks. She's back. The one and only and great Anna, RAI mom, Kelly. How you doing, Anna? I'm so good. So good to be back with you. Absolutely. So in the last couple of weeks, we talked about two exciting things. I thought we should just do an update video. It might be a little shorter than most, but I think it would be relevant. You are trying to assume a VA loan. I think we should get an update on that. I'm sure it will be long and drawn out, but it's been a couple of weeks. And then second, and probably most importantly, uh, you are trying to get some Florida properties insured, having some trouble, but finding a way to get it done. And I think a lot of folks yes. are like, hey, can you help me? Can I, can you give me your, can you give me your guy's name so I can get some help as well? So feel free to start yes. with either of those, but let's do a, a catch up video. Wonderful. Yeah. So let's talk about the VA loan assumption. So for anybody that missed the last video, go listen to it because we talk about it kind of in depth and, and mm -hmm. what the returns might do when you're looking at a, a property that you're buying for a 2.375% fixed rate mortgage for 30 years versus, yeah. you know, 7.4% um, or higher for investors on, on a mortgage today. Um, so I, I have a, a property in San Antonio, Texas under contract, and it is a veteran loan. And so basically three types of loans have assumption clauses, um, FHA, USDA, and VA when it comes to agencies. But FHA and USDA require you to be an owner occupant in order to buy that property and assume the seller's loan. So VA doesn't actually publish their guidelines and they technically don't prohibit investors from assuming a VA loan. So one thing that we talked about before is, is go search on the MLS for the keyword, you know, loan assumption and look for those that are VA, but it is a long drawn out process, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. So it's been almost a month that I've had the property under contract we had to fill out a couple of forms for the VA. Uh, the seller had to fill out a few, you know, granting me authorization to talk to them um, and granting me the ability to take over their loan. I filled out a few and just kept waiting and waiting and waiting. And the, the VA was supposed to reach out to me. Of course, they didn't. So I called in a few times and followed up and got an appointment. And on that call, they said, we're scheduling phone applications. So you can't send us anything yet, but hmm. we will schedule a phone application. So that application was two weeks out and I had it yesterday. And okay. so essentially they go over all your financials on the phone and then you answer a few questions and they'll either kind of pre-approve you based on that and send you a loan package to fill out and keep going through their underwriting or they'll issue you a denial. So what's important that I've learned through this process, because this is the first time I've done one of these, is that while the VA and Penny Mac, who owns most of those VA loans, um, will make an exception and allow investors to buy a VA loan assumption, you basically have to qualify for the lender that's holding that mortgage already. And that lender, Michael, something I just learned, just like on new loans, they can have overlays or their mm. own requirement on top of the VA's requirement as to whether or not they will approve you for a loan. So I found out, unfortunately, that the lender that has the loan for the seller generally has an overlay that even though the VA will allow investors to take over the loan, they don't. Mm. So I've asked for an exception and it's gone to underwriting. And I've told them I'm not going to live in this. Um, yeah. You know, Be they want to know, will you live in it? In, will you live in it in the next you know, few months after repairs, yada, yada? And I answered no, because I'm not, and I'm not going right. to lie and commit mortgage fraud, right? So you always answer you. these things honestly. So I said, no, I'm not going to live in it, but I'm asking for an exception because the VA and Penny Mac said that they will grant an exception. So it's gone out now to underwriting. And by Friday, I will either have a letter in the mail that says, you know, we're not qualifying you because you're an investor. Or, okay, everything looks good. Now fill out these forms and we continue to go. But they told yeah. us it's essentially from the date of application, 60 to 90 days for them to approve you. And you're about 30, 45 days into this at this point? About 30 days in, but it's from the application, which was ah, yesterday. Got so it. this thing could drag on quite some time. But yeah. again, as an investor, I'm willing to go through the process. Um, yeah. 
you know, I, they, they hit my credit yesterday. I am not exaggerating. I've had over 15 calls today from mortgage lenders that saw my credit was pulled who yeah. were begging me to do a mortgage with them, which is funny because a year ago when things were crazy, you applied for a mortgage and you might hear from one or two. Now it's yeah. like, but you know, every lender out there is, is calling to say, what can we do for you? Um, yeah. So that, that's the update on that, you know, not a okay. whole lot of movement, but one thing I will say early on is it's probably good for any investors who want to assume a VA loan to try to get a hold of that lender. I tried as well and couldn't get anybody for days. They just mm -hmm. you know continue to go to voicemail, um, but ask them if they have overlays. And even though mm -hmm. the VA may allow you to assume it as an investor, the lender that you're assuming it from may not, but always ask for exceptions. Because I've, yeah. I've been surprised at how many times I've asked for exceptions and I've actually gotten the exception. So yeah. if you don't ask, you don't, you don't get. So, yeah. you know, the key, it, the it's, key to great deals 50, is follow 50. up. Yeah. 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 Follow up, follow through. Yeah. It's, it'll be fun to watch again. This is not something you or I have done. So uh, I will be a, a fly in your shoulder kind of watching this transpire. And uh, I know if anybody can get it done, can get the exception, it will be you. Uh, so uh, I look forward to the updates in the weeks to come. Thanks. And, you know, if you are wanting to get started, like we talk about all the time, what would you do if you were just starting out? I highly recommend, and I know you do too, house hacking. Mm -hmm. So if you can VA assume a loan that you actually want to live in, you have a much better chance of actually qualifying for that loan. Same with FHA, USDA. So look for some small multi-units or, or yeah. single family or duplex, ideally more than one unit in the property, somewhere between two and four. And you might be able to house hack at an extremely low loan assumption rate um, that could really make you a lot of cash flow. So don't give up on that, um, especially if you're if you're going to live in it. Now, yeah. kind of transitioning to insurance. Um, so two weeks ago, we talked about, you know, the, the crazy increase in insurance costs in Florida. Um, and there's some other markets like Louisiana and California as well. Insurance has gone up everywhere, but in Florida in particular, um, I gave an example of of two properties I have, but the, the townhouse that I have, it's an in-unit townhouse in Navarre, Florida, between mm -hmm. Destin and Pensacola. And my insurance, when I bought the property two years ago as a short-term rental, went from $13,000 that included a seventy a seven thousand I think six hundred dollar premium for the wind and hail and other perils, and then about six thousand dollars for my flood insurance. Mm -hmm. The next year, that seventy six hundred dollar policy jumped to be um, over twelve thousand dollars, and then I got my flood insurance down a little bit because I went with the national flood insurance program. But still, my total all in was about about that 13,000 again total. Well, this year I got renewals and my main policy which includes, you know, hurricane coverage and all other perils went to 17,000 and some change. So literally from 7,600 to almost 17,600, $10,000 increase in 2 years. And this is happening to people that own short-term rentals and long-term rentals all over Florida. And so that's plus flood. So when you add flood, I was at almost, I was at about $22,300 for insurance. So wow. 9,000 total increase in two years, that can kill all of your profits. If you bought a property as a short-term rental, when you add that and tax increases, a lot of people are now upside down for cash, unfortunately. So I went and said, okay, what other carriers can I go with? Let's switch insurance companies. The problem, Michael, is most insurance companies have left Florida. And I know it's mm. happening in California yeah. as well. And yeah. there aren't other options. Well, it doesn't seem like it. You know, your agent will say, well, there's nobody else I can insure you with. So two things, the age of your property and whether or not it's on stilts makes a big difference in your insurance. There's also something called wind mitigation. And if you do certain things to have better likelihood that wind and hurricanes aren't going to blow off your roof and blow the house off the stilts or blow out your windows, you can get substantial discounts and credits. And so what I did is I went to my broker and she said, I can't get you anything else. Your property's too old. It was built in the eighties. And essentially she referred me to Allstate, who was still supposed to be issuing policies. They will only issue policies if the property's less than 20 years old. Mm -hmm. So mine was out. 
They then referred me to someone else who has hard to handle, you know, cases, which is basically anything older than 20 years old. Um, and that agent said, hey, there's something called citizens insurance, which is basically somewhat subsidized in cooperation with the state of Florida. And they're basically the insurer of last resort. So we look at the Fed as the lender of last resort. These are the insurer of last resort. And what they'll do is they will give you the policy for hurricane coverage, wind and hurricane. So it doesn't cover your normal things like a fire or a hailstorm or whatever. It's just okay. meant to protect you from hurricanes. Um, and then we had to find a different insurer to handle all other perils, your liability, your fire, et cetera. So okay. ultimately the lender, the, the insurance broker that could handle citizens couldn't find an insurance company that would handle my property because it was on stilts on mm -hmm. the ocean. So he referred me to another insurance broker. So Michael, I now have three insurance companies, three insurance brokers, one for flood, one for hurricane and one for all other perils. But by wow. doing that, I just finally got everything bound today. By doing that, the combination of my three policies added up to $12,300 instead of 22,000 and a little more than 300. So I've saved $10,000 by going by not giving up and saying there's got to be other options. And so I that's a huge difference in your cash flow and your returns. And there's no guarantee it's not going to go up even more next year. So mm -hmm. any of you that are in Florida, I will put the the link to my broker's name that has the wind and hurricane coverage because that's the hardest piece to get. And then he can refer you to, you know, people that can get the all other perils coverage if he can't. He can also handle flood insurance. Um, so I'll put that in the comments here and on our last video, but I highly recommend that any of you that are dealing with insurance that's just skyrocketing, especially if you're in Florida, Louisiana, the coast of Texas or Georgia or Alabama in California, um, that you you beat down the door and you find out what you can do if you separate out each of the pieces yeah. to where each insurer has a little less risk because now they're just insuring for the probability of that one thing instead of the probability of all those things happening. Yeah, I think what you know this is this is valuable information because a lot of investors, myself included, for probably the first decade, thought one insurance company was like all of them, right? And they were just right. competing on price. Right. And what you've just highlighted is there are insurance companies for specific perils. So yes. what you basically created was a sandwich or a cake or whatever you want to call it. So you're you have complete coverage and that provider is doing their thing. Um, yes. I I think there's a lot of folks out there that got shocking insurance quotes and just swallowed hard instead of trying to go, hey, let, let me go make some phone calls. I mean, how many hours <laughs> did you spend trying to track down something that ultimately saved you 10, you saved 10 grand this year and probably yes. more, you know, the next year. So how long did you spend doing this? You know, I probably spent between all of the phone calls and paperwork and applications, I probably spent eight hours, mm -hmm. something like that. So not a significant amount of time for the amount of money that I'm saving and hopefully can save, you know, year after year. It's, it was well right. worth, you know, the, the no, no, no. And, the, and then when they said, no, we can't do it, I said, do you know anybody that yeah. can? What other insurance companies do you know that write with a different carrier than you can write with? And they were all really happy to say, hey, give this guy a call or, hey, I can do this piece. I can't do this, but I've got a friend who he's appointed with all these other agencies that I'm not, and he can do the other piece with you. So they're they're really cooperating well together because they're all in the same boat yeah. and they're all losing certain clients. So why not offer you the piece that they can and then get you to somebody else that can satisfy the other pieces and, and they'll get a lot more clients that way. Very, very cool. Well, I know you're going to put his name and contact details below in the comments. Do you want to just give him a plug and a shout out in the video or how do you want to handle that? Absolutely. His name is Luke Bishop and he is in Navarre, Florida. Um, I don't have his agency name. I think it's proper insurance, but I will put all those details in the comment. And Luke was great because again, he he looked at all the different options. He had me go through the wind mitigation inspection. I forgot to say that. 
And it cost me $350. The guy came out and because of what he saw in the property and its construction was able to cut the um, citizens piece by about $3,500 because I had the things I needed to mitigate high wind damage when they put a new roof on the property a few years ago. So he walked me through all the pieces to say, you know, it's high, but if we do this and I can get you someone there tomorrow, then you might be able to save another X, Y, Z. So he was very knowledgeable, looking at all different kinds of ways to figure out how to get it done and ultimately saved me a ton of money. So I'm very grateful and grateful to share his name with others. Luke Bishop. Nice work, brother. Good job. Anna, where can people find you? Great. You can find me here on your channel. You can find me on social media at Anna Kelly, REI Mom, and my website, REIMom.com. Thank you so much.